Hey everybody, welcome to the show, the one and only show, the Animus Air show. This week we're going to talk why stoicism makes you weak and what, of course, you can do about it. And of course, there's something you can do about it. And uh, guess what? We're going to talk about that. We're going to stick with this slide format. I think this works because it it keeps me on track. I have a tendency, if it's just me recording myself, I have a tendency to get off track and not really cover what I ultimately need to cover. We'll try this this week, maybe a couple more weeks. Maybe I'll intersperse this with the video format. I don't don't, don't want you to, to uh, deprive you of, uh, you know, certain pleasant visual aspects of of my being, my voice being just one of them. Yeah, why stoicism makes you weak, what to do about it. Oh boy, this is just, I just cannot talk about this enough. Every time that I talk about stoicism and try to suss out the root and the problems with it, I think, well, that's it. Everybody gets it. And then I see, see some post or some video and I think people still are into stoicism. Now, I just want to say a caveat before we get started. Not all stoicism is incorrect. Before I lose you guys, before I lose you guys who just read three volumes of Epictetus or Seneca, do they even write that much? I know, we all have meditations on our bookshelf, and it looks really good there, and it makes us all look very smart. I don't want to completely discredit stoicism. It's not all incorrect. I think there are some useful parts of it. There's useful aphorisms, that's for sure. I mean, you look through uh, meditations, and we'll get to it later in the quotations part of this presentation. You, you look at through meditations, and some of the things that Marcus Aurelius says, you go, yeah, this is correct. This is very helpful. And I think a lot of stoicism now is ultimately adapted. It's not real stoicism. You know, if you hear Tim Ferriss or somebody talking about stoicism and how it's been helpful, or the other guy, Ryan Holiday, uh, yeah, go get issue one of the magazine. You have an interview with Ryan Holiday in there. What they're talking about isn't stoicism. I mean, it's some enlightened version of it. I mean, if you go watch Joel Olstein preach, that's not really Christianity. Joel Olstein's up there telling you to make money. That's not really what Christianity was about. Now, can you go take out one line in the Bible where Jesus said something about maybe making money is helpful? The parable of talents that comes to mind, not even a biblical scholar. So I'm sure it's in there, but that's not the foundations of Christianity. Now, I do think, I mean, everybody makes fun of Joel Osteen, but hey, uh, we're, we're all, Christianity, religion is always going to be around. Let's at least take it in a more useful direction. And I think he's he's part of that solution. But let's not call that Christianity, because it's not. Unless you're drinking your laundry water and using up a, a rock as a pillow, you're not really being a Christian, which is fine. I don't think being a Christian is necessarily the right thing to do. I think we need to adopt these things, adapt these, and adopt them to our more, I think, in line with reality views, more enlightenment views. And hey, at least stoicism is a philosophy. At least guys are getting into philosophy. Like, I think going to CrossFit and doing 30 snatches in a row is stupid and you're going to hurt yourself, but at least you're doing something. Hey, I love making fun of CrossFit, but at least it's introducing lifting platforms. I go to the local gym and they have bumper plates. That's CrossFit. So if nothing else, Stoicism is getting a lot of young men into philosophy, great. But let's really look at the foundations. There's package deals in Stoicism that seem great on the surface, And you will adopt them into your lives and ultimately they will be the end of you. Seeds of your own destruction. Stoicism carries with it the seeds of its own destruction. Like the Renaissance did. The Renaissance was a huge step forward for mankind. No question. I don't want to go back to the 12th century like that one foreign professor I was telling you about. He said the best century is the 12th century. I actually found that book. It's still online. You you can still buy it. I'm not going to read it. I I recommend when you read it and uh, get back to me. So the Renaissance was great in that it, you know, had had us question things and, huh, you know, maybe the church shouldn't be in charge. But what did it throw out when it threw out the church is threw out the importance of ideas. And I think that's how we can view Stoicism. Ultimately, we could say maybe even a good thing, but let's really look at it. And, you know, these foundations are crucial. When we're dealing with philosophy... You can mess up some things in your life. That's fine. Some things aren't the most foundational. But when we're dealing with philosophy, if you even have the seed 
of a maladaptive idea in your psyche. And especially if it's a small kernel of a seed, it's going to be very difficult to suss out and it's going to go around affecting your life and your relationships and yeah, your relationship with reality in a maladaptive way. So this isn't so much to criticize stoicism, of course it is, but it's more about, hey, let's figure out what's really going on with this philosophy. So when you pick up uh, meditations, you are not negatively influenced by it. And promotion and misempire.com slash schedule. If you just to, to reach out, to reach out, do the non-stoic thing. We're going to get to it. Do the non-stoic thing. And if nothing else, just reach out. If I can't help you, I'm going to point you to somebody who can. But especially when it comes to managing our psychological issues, simply taking that first step, admitting that, I don't want to say help. You don't need help, but you need some guidance. This is tricky. You're dealing with uncon- your unconscious. If you if you get a personal trainer to go show you how to do a, a freaking bench press, I think you're going to need some sort of help with your unconscious. Much murkier than uh, than your pecs. All right, overview. I'm going to go through some stoic myths here. Uh, my experience with stoicism, history of stoicism, then Stoicism Today, How It Manifests Today. We'll go through some quotations, which I swear I picked at random, and you'll see some of the quotations are actually good. And the final part is, I think it's going to be a healthier, effective way. Yeah, the only problem with doing the, the slideshow presentation is on, I, if you're just listening on audio, it may not have the same effect, but I'm going to work on making this useful even if even if you can't see the presentations. So going through the overview now. Overview now. Okay, good. All right, so some myths about stoicism, just to get them out of the way, is it makes you less emotional. I mean, this is actually not true. In truth, it's going to make you more emotional. That, that, those, that word emotional should be in quotation marks. I think being emotional is good. However, how we use it t- today, the, the modern idiomatic expression of it is you're overly emotional. Your emotions are out of control. Now, on the surface, stoicism looks like it's training you to be less emotional, or at least to be more in control of your emotions, but I would submit that the way stoicism trains you to do this, in the long term, it's going to make you more emotional. It's going to make you more tuned out. You you know, you're a guy, so you may not be overly emotional like a woman and be hysterical, but what's the male version of being overly emotional is tune out, avoid, shut down, not engage, and this is just not going to be useful for you. Myth two is improves your willpower. Guess what the truth is? Of course, it negates your willpower by focusing on willpower alone. And I do think willpower is important, and we do have it, and to some extent, free will exists, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here talking about these issues. But if you just want to train your willpower, if you think that willpower is a muscle that you need to train like your pecs, you're not really going to have willpower. You're going to have what ultimately amounts to the illusion of willpower. We'll get to it. And I guess similarly, more control is a myth. Um, but the truth is, is it's uh, going to give you less control. I guess this goes back to the willpower. I am being redundant. That's okay. But this is important to discuss. I'm just go through my experience with stoicism. Look, I was a, a serious young man at, at one point in my life. Um, so I, I was attracted to stoicism. I, I read meditations. I read a bunch of other stoics, and it made a lot of sense to me. I'm, I'm just going to focus on what I can control. And really what, what this came from was a fear of looking stupid. I didn't want to look stupid. I wanted to. I didn't know at the time. I wanted to have the airs of maturity. But that's not how this really works. My overall shift was to go from trying to control my thoughts, my emotions, my actions to connect. Not just connect with other people, but get more in touch with what's going on with me. And then I found through this process, through this going sideways, you know, not going right to the well, what I wanted, which was maybe a stronger work ethic wasn't just about training up my work ethic. It was connecting with myself in other ways, possibly by connecting with other people. 
And then I found that the work ethic or the maturity or I would just act in better ways or I'd make decisions and I just stopped regretting decisions after a while. It was strange, but I just stopped regretting decisions. So I wasn't so worried about, oh, I got to make a good decision. And more concerned with, of course, getting good at making decisions. So yeah, my original state was, look, you know, coming from the Midwest, playing high school sports, work hard, have a good attitude. This helps to a certain extent, but you get to a certain place in your life and it's just not helpful. You realize that you don't have the emotional maturity to meet the demands of your environment. And this is when you start shutting down. And th- th- this is why it's so important because this is when young men, I think, go out for help. And if all they see is stoicism, then stoicism is going to rationalize their shutdown. But thankfully, I also started reading Jung around this time. This is probably 2021. 20, um, you know, just it wasn't a good time for me. I don't think it's a good time for any 20, 21 year old male. It's just difficult. You know, that's fine. It's just what we go through. Let's go through this process as quickly as we can, but more importantly, let's get the most amount of information out of this process. And if we just have some guy, uh, Epictetus telling us to focus on what we can control and not focus on what we don't control, that's not going to be helpful. That's just work hard and have a good attitude in a different context. And this is funny because you know, just around this time, hmm, the, for some reason around this time, the girls who I met were just the, the seemed to be the craziest girls. And whenever I see guys online complain about, oh, girls are crazy. And I went out with this girl the other night and she's totally nuts. Or, oh, the idea to this girl and she ended up being a total psychopath. She just mimicked everything that I did. How was I supposed to know? Yeah, you were tuned out of yourself. And because you're tuned out of yourself, you're tuned out of your environment. All these signs are there. And I know because I went through this too. It's fine. You got to take responsibility for it. And stoicism does not help with this. What stoicism is going to do is it's just going to tell you to to tune out more. Now, dating the, quote, crazy girls, that's just where this problem comes to the most fruition, I guess you could say, for most guys. It's just where we feel it the most. Um. But, and yes, I started reading Jung and then I started to journal about my emotions. I thought this was really stupid. I, I didn't tell anybody about this. I got this idea indirectly, I think, from Brandon. I don't think, Nathaniel Brandon, I don't think it was in any one of his books, but I think just doing research on him, I'm just, I decided, you know what, what I'm doing isn't working. I don't have the work ethic I want. I don't have the relationship with women that I want. I'm just going to just just give up in a sense. And I'm just going to start doing this journaling about emotions thing. And it really felt stupid. Then I started talking through my emotions. Then I started to seek out helpful group therapy. I could have a whole other chapter in here about going to to, to crazy therapists that weren't helpful at all. Um, And that's why in in part I, I got into it and that's why I do the unconscious map and the course unconscious map. The course is even if you do have a bad therapist now, well, now there's a way to get good therapy, even from a bad therapist. Show you what to talk about and exactly how to talk about it and exactly the goal. Yeah. The goal you're supposed to, eh, goal is not the right word, but the purpose of therapy, what the realizations in therapy need to be. Now those realizations are going to be different for different people particularly, but overall the realizations are the same. And I have here, I went to a de facto heroin group. I didn't go to a group for heroin addicts, but I ended up going to this group <laughs> that ended up, yeah, it, it, it was an unwritten rule that it was for uh, heroin addicts. But I went anyways and they didn't care and that helped me way more <laughs> than all the reading Seneca and oh, trying to control my thoughts and emotions. And so the resolution was, yeah, the shift. Instead of focusing on things outside of myself, focus on my relationship with myself. Now, the typical, this is the religious shift. Oh, instead of focusing on this material world, focus on a higher spiritual realm. But the problem with that religious shift is it doesn't help you in this material world. Focusing on the relationship with yourself and your emotions, your conduit through which you relate with reality, that is inadvertently going to affect the, yeah, your relationship with the material world in a positive way. I, this is not at the expense, and 
believe me, I am a Westerner. This is definitely not at the expense of focusing on the material world. That really matters. I think this is the shift that a lot of guys need to go to. Yeah, you know, a lot of guys, they just go to work hard, have a good attitude, and then, well, more working hard and have a good attitude, more reading stoicism, and they, I, th I think they just hurt themselves. And they get in these states where you feel stuck, you feel lost, things aren't working out, you're not really sure why. And everybody else online is complaining about the government and women and feminism, so I'm just going to do that too. I don't get my wife. My wife doesn't make any sense. Oh, she makes me so angry. Nope, got to go to my stoic practice. Got to, got to control this. This is bad. This is going to, in the long run, lead to huge problems. All right, so history of stoicism. Let's get to the root of, well, what's particularly going on with this philosophy that makes it less than helpful? Well, it didn't really start with stoicism. It started with uh, the cynics. This is Diogenes, named after dogs. That's why he's there with dogs, named after dogs, because to show their contempt for the world, they would urinate in the street like dogs. But this was a philosophy built on having contempt for the world. People are irrational. The world is, is irrational. It doesn't really make any sense. So we're going to go live outside society in a sense, disconnecting ourselves from the world uh, so we don't have to deal with it. And you see he has, he has a lantern there. Do we know why he had the lantern? Yes, of course, because the story was that Diogenes would go through the... So this is in Greece now. He would go through the Agora with a lantern in daylight <laughs> looking for one honest man, obviously making a theatrical expression <laughs> out of his inability to get along in the world. Things aren't fair. The world doesn't make sense. Everything's irrational. I'm going to tune out. Now, this sounds like exactly something that the Stoics did. This is Zeno of Sidium, Sitium. Actually, not sure how to pronounce that. Um, and he was the first Stoic philosopher. Chrysippus developed his ideas, but the, the, uh, Zeno was the first uh, Stoic philosopher. And it was adopted from the Cynics. Just a less egregious form of the, of the philosophy of the Cynics. It didn't <laughs> actually leave society and go around urinating in the streets with a lantern looking for one honest man, but this is what the Stoics did psychologically. They took what the Cynics did physically and just made it psychological. Yes, the world is irrational. Yes, it doesn't make any sense. Yes, men, they we can't always communicate with them. But what we can do is we can turn in on ourselves. We can't focus on what's going on in us, and we can change that. We can't change other men. We can't change the world. That's irrational. The cynics are right there. We're not going to go urinating in the streets, though. We're just going to do, uh, um, yeah, just turn in on ourselves. Great nose, Zena. Zena. I say Zena, Zeno. Great nose, Zeno. <laughs> oh, man. For some reason, I find that nose appealing. <laughs> There's something... Yeah, I always know when somebody's trying to be nice when they say, Mark, your your nose is very Roman. I mean, Zeno wasn't Ro Roman, he was Greek, but eh, same thing, ultimately. Greek, Italian, what's the difference? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, oh, I, I have a Roman nose, is that it? Mm. Or <laughs> you're saying I have a, a big nose and you're trying to be nice about it. Thanks for trying to be nice. And that's where you get the name Stoic from, it means porch. Zeno would preach from the porch, which is a great indication of where stoicism leaves us and like urinating on the streets and removing yourselves from society is a great indication of, of what cynicism was about this is a great indication you're not you're not really care to do anything useful you're not going to get off the porch to actually live in this world which may seem appealing when the world is irrational but ultimately this leads you morally bankrupt two duties of stoicism the first one, duty of acceptance. Now, I, I've heard Ryan Holiday talk about stoicism. He he says there's five part or there's four parts of stoicism. It's like equality, justice. He says all these things. Where are you getting this from? That this is not what stoic. I mean, if that's what you want to make stoicism into, like Joel Olstein makes Christianity into the religion that tells you to go out and make money, and be happy in this world. 
that's fine, I guess, but then it's no longer Christianity. It's no longer Stoicism. There were two duties of Stoicism. First, the duty of acceptance. I just want to make a aside here. This is not the same as the good kind of acceptance, the psychological acceptance. This is accept the physical world for what it is. There's nothing you can do to change it, so just accept it. As opposed to the good kind of acceptance, which is accept where you are so you can change it. The less than helpful kind of acceptance, the stoic kind of acceptance, is the final uh, action. It's, it's the final thing to do, as opposed to the good kind of acceptance, which is the first thing. You accept where you are, you accept who you are, you accept all your issues so you can go and change them. If you want to fix a problem in your life, you first have to look at the problem and I would even say, go into the problem, look around, perhaps live in the problem. I know it's painful, but that is your path to solving the problem. Not in spite of the pain, but perhaps through the pain. That's the good kind of acceptance. Um, but this is not that. And so what this turns into is a redefinition of control. Now, if you read a Stoic and he talks about how important control is, you're like, oh yeah, that's great. I, I want more control. So I'm going to read Seneca. He's talking about control. I like control. That's what Marcus Aurelius is talking about. But it's really a redefinition of control. It is redefining control to only what is going on within your mind, within your psychology. And then saying, hey, we offer control. It's not really what's going on. This is uh, very similar to the Christian view of happiness or Christian in its original state view of happiness. The Christian would say, oh no, what we're offering you is more happiness. And you go, oh really? Okay, well part of my happiness is getting along with my girlfriend or getting a new girlfriend or making more money. And the Christian will say, well, no, 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 that, that's not happiness. Happiness is just your connection with God. And you'll see that's the true happiness. They're not really offering you happiness. They're redefining it and then kind of shoehorning in their definition for years and kind of, relying on the fact that you're not going to think about it. And you can convince yourself, <laughs> the scary part is, is, you can convince yourself that your relationship with God is really what you wanted all along. Just like you can convince yourself that this redefinition of control is really what you wanted all along. And you go, yeah, good. Exa exactly what I wanted. And then anything that you can accept, like all philosophies, that ask you to give up a part of yourself, anything that you uh, can't accept, anything about the world, it's absorbed by God in a sense. It's part of God's plan. Stoicism is at its root a pantheistic philosophy. It means God is everywhere. So actually, to try to change the world, according to Stoicism, is trying to change God, which is a blasphemous. Now, I mean, they really didn't have gravity to, to those terms like blasphemy and heretical that they had back then. Uh, before Christianity, but it went against this duty of Stoicism to want to change the world or, ch or change somebody else or do anything that really matters that much in, in the physical world. It's, well, no, that's you trying to change God in a sense. If God's everywhere, if God's in everything, well, why would you? That That's not your jurisdiction. And what this is, is uh, compatibilism. I mean, a lot of people have criticized us for being determinists. That's not true. They're actually compatibilists. And this is the 4 by 4 chart of uh, free will versus uh, determinism. Or really on the left, it's external reality. And on the top is your choices. So when there's no free will and reality is determined, that, that's hard determinism. That's Marxism. That's materialism. And then no free will in reality is indetermined. That's hard indeterminism, or really just indeterminism. Let's leave it there for now. These are the fun guys. <laughs> you want to go hang out with uh, Schopenhauer. There's no free will, but reality is indeterminate. Hey, that's a party. <laughs> that is a party for sure. And then there's uh, libertarianism, not the political party. Um, but philosophical libertarianism. We have free will. Reality is indeterminate. But compatibilism is we have free will. Yet reality is still determined, which leads to, yeah, you can change your thoughts, you can change your emotions, but it doesn't matter in the world. There's really nothing you can do about it. 
So what this amounts to is uh, the grin and bear it philosophy. <laughs> or, <laughs> I have this in quotations because I'm not sure I'm the one who thought of this, but it's a great saying about compatibilism is it's like not eating your cake and not having it too. <laughs> I just think that's uh, I just think that's funny. So here we have here, you know, this this, this philosophy. I mean, I think we can see here this philosophy that's uh, supposedly marketed as, well, it is marketed as being manly, having a sense of masculinity. I mean, what is masculinity? There's lots of ways that we can define masculinity. But my friend Ariane, I like how she puts it. She says it's taking up space in the world. And in a sense, that's one way to think about it. I mean, that's not how I, how I would define it. I would define it as psychological individualism plus testosterone. But what this amounts to is taking up space in the world. But here we have a philosophy that actually admonishes you not to do that at its core. It admonishes you not to do that. Does Ryan Holiday say something different? I don't know, but it's not stoicism. And this matters because I'm sure... I haven't read all of Ryan Holiday's books, but I'm sure there's some practices that he would talk about in there just because he's influenced by stoicism that would inevitably lead to you shutting down, taking up less space in the world, being passive, which is ine inevitably more feminine. Oh yeah, so the religious happiness analogy. Redefining happiness and then offering in that bastardized version of happiness. It's not real happiness. When you, when you went to the priest for help, you were thinking, oh, I got this problem with my girlfriend. Help me figure that out. Okay, well, what do we have to do if you have a problem with your girlfriend? You got to understand, well, you got to understand a lot of things, but there's two things you have to understand. You have to understand yourself better, and you have to understand her better. Or how about women in general? Well, <laughs> that's not really what the uh, religion is there to do. Understanding yourself better, looking at yourself, they're just call you self-absorbed and then understanding your girlfriend better. Well, who are you? In a sense saying this is God's jurisdiction, not yours. Who are you to understand women better? It's all a mystery. Just accept it and create a better relationship with God. It's not what we want. And it's definitely not masculine. It's not going to get you what you want and you're going to be miserable. All right. The second duty of stoicism is duty of passivity. Now, that's not my own translation. That's, I, I don't know what the real, what the original uh, ancient Greek word is. I don't want to go and, and, and read, uh, read all this in ancient Greek, but this is just the, the general accepted translation is that it's the duty of passivity. I, I just say that because you think, oh, you're just saying it's the duty of passivity to make it look worse. No, this is what it is. This is what it's accepted as the duty of passivity, which is emphasis of inner state over external circumstances. Uh, this is just a really just a different shade of of the duty of acceptance, and we see this often today. Dirty dishes analogy, or dirt, not analogy, but example. I mean, I mean, this is right out of uh, what people talk about. Um, I guess this more goes into stoicism today, cognitive behavioral therapy. But this is right out of cognitive behavioral therapy manual. Nah, I'm getting this all mixed up. Even with slides, I'm still all over the place. Oh, geez. I'm working on this. So you come home and there's dirty dishes in the sink. Your roommate left all these dirty dishes. I mean, what do you do? Do you talk to your roommate about it? Do you go, hey, what's going on here? Well, according to stoicism, that's not what you do. Who are you to get angry at dirty dishes? It's a weakness in you that you get angry or that you get frustrated over this. Really what you need to do is you need to turn in on yourself, tell yourself that having this frustration, having this anger at your roommate is irrational, and then go and read Seneca for the next three hours. We often see people talking like this, uh, you know, like online gurus, you know, self-help guys, lecture bros as I call them on Twitter. Yeah, I was at this dinner party and this guy was... You know, talking about something that he knew nothing about, but, you know, instead of talking with him about it, I just didn't let it bother me because whatever, that's his issue. And well, whatever he thinks is going to be whatever he thinks. And I'm not, just not going to talk to him about it. Yeah. Except, except here's what may be going on. Is he going to change his mind if you argue with him about it in the moment? You know, probably not, but I don't think that's the ultimate point of having an argument. 
the ultimate point of having an argument is to develop your own ideas, which you're not going to do if you keep shutting down. And I would challenge you that probably the reason you're shutting down, even though you look really cool on, on your, your, your Twitter avatar there, you have a nice suit on and everything. I bet the reason you're shutting down is because you're anxious. You're anxious because you've been reading Seneca for so long. You've disengaged for such a long time that interacting and having a genuine uh, human connection is anxiety provoking to you. Cause I guessing that you're not that sure of your ideas. You're not that sure of your emotions. You're not sure if you might blow up in the middle of an argument, which I'm guessing, which is a definitely a reasonable fear. If you've been reading Epictetus. So that's why you shut down. And you know what? You may know more than this guy at this cocktail dinner party, but I've gotten in arguments with people, discussions, I call them spirited discussions, who I know way more than, who I'm way smarter than, and you still learn something. It's like, oh, that's a, I mean, you're wrong, but that's an interesting way of viewing it. I've, I've never seen <laughs> the wrongness of that from that perspective exactly. This is how you learn and grow. You don't learn and grow by rationalizing away your frustrations and your emotions. Your frustrations, your emotions are a lens into your own awareness, which you don't see because you're a stoic and you think all emotions are inherently irrational. It's lower, it's material, it's this, it has to do with the material world, it's irrational, you could just ignore it. And go up to your supposed higher plane of, of meditation and Marcus Aurelius. And here we see that control is really giving up control again, like the religious Christian version of happiness. It's not really happiness at all. What does this sound like? Yeah, sounds like rationalization to me. I agree, Kanye. And then the context in which Stoicism was developed. This is the Roman Empire. Uh, so Stoicism was developed, you know, around 200 BC, and this is what was happening around 200 BC: the growing Roman Empire. Yeah, people think it's a Roman philosophy. It's not. The Romans got it from the Greeks. It was. It started with the Greeks, and so this is what was happening. So, what were the Greeks really doing? What was Zeno really doing? What was Chrysippus really doing? They were rationalizing this world that they can't control. There was this foreign power that yeah, had more power than they had and they saw the end of of their city-state and there's nothing they could do about it. In fact, they, they saw the end of this before, even before 200 BC. I mean, back in Aristotle. Aristotle predicted all this too. You know, so there are hints of this happening. And so they developed a philosophy, you could say, to manage the fact that they couldn't deal with the world. Well, is this the kind of philosophy you want to adapt and what does this say about what you implicitly think about the world that you are attracted to Stoicism? It's fine. I'm not criticizing you, but we got to be honest about these things. And I'm not saying the development of Stoicism led to the expansion of Rome, but hey, let's be honest here. A nation of men, a nation of men in their 20s who are practicing Stoicism, doing their Marcus Aurelius meditation thing is going to be way more easy to conquer than a nation of men who adopt different philosophies, which we're going to get to. So part four, cognitive psychology. This is stoicism today, I guess we could say. And a good way to think about this is just when it comes to understanding stoicism or cognitive psychology, CBT, ACT, solution-focused therapy. Oh, you're solution-focused? Oh, yeah, because every other therapy to ever exist didn't care about solutions at all. You're the solution-focused one because that's your name. Like Antifa. Oh, I go, okay, so I guess you must be anti-fascist because that's your name. Okay, now I'm getting off topic. So just replace emotions for a Roman Empire and you have cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, you have stoicism too, but this is just a helpful way to think of cognitive behavioral therapy. Their emotions are there. They're... You know, they're ultimately in control. Let's just try to be happy within this smaller confines of how we redefine happiness and control. And that's kind of behavioral therapy. This is accepting the premise of the psychoanalysts that emotions are irrational. At least the psychoanalysts were trying to deal with the emotions. I, I would say in less than effective ways, not Jung. I think he had really effective ways, but let's just say Freud 
but at least we're trying to deal with it. The kind of behavioral therapist just ignore it ultimately. I mean, they definitely ignore the root. They don't ignore emotions. If you're a kind of behavioral therapist, I know you deal with emotions, but it's not in the correct way, which we're going to get to. But why are emotions so important? And those, we're going to, is a little bit similar to what we talked about last week. It's okay. It's good to discuss things that have been decided. I'm going to say that every week, you know. Why dig into emotions? Why does it even matter? Because emotions are in control. And nobody denies this. Nobody denies that emotions are in control. The only reason that we don't dig into them, the only reason we don't focus on them, is because we don't understand them. You don't have actions. You do not create an action. You do not act in the world unless it's at first emotional. So ever wonder why you want to act in one way, but instead act another way? Or the inverse, ever wonder why you don't want to do something, but you end up doing that thing? It's because that there are emotions there that you do not face. And you think you can just ignore them and do your meditation affirmation thing, and that's going to control the emotion, or you think you can just change the emotion or simply accept the emotion, which, is, okay, that can be helpful. And there are kind of behavioral therapists that do that. I guess that's more explicitly the part of ACT, but that's still only part of the solution. We have to understand emotions. We need to understand exactly how they work. There is no other way out of this. I'm actually reading, a, I was mentioning last week, I'm going to be reading this for a while. Uh, this other guy's unification of psychology and he just gets right to this point and then skips right off of it. Oh, it's so disheartening. Maybe I'll do a, a podcast about that or have him on the podcast talk about it. And so what this leads to is what I, something I call the cognitive fa- fantasy. It's focus on what you want and what you don't want will simply go away. Uh, and this simply does not work. It may work especially when there are no other issues present, when there's not really a complex. Like somebody can comes in and says, yeah, I just have a difficult time organizing my day. You can work with them and help them to create a schedule and that can work sometimes. But usually when somebody comes in the clinic and they have a difficult time organizing their day, it's because there's other issues going on. But this isn't, you know, this, yeah, sorry, I got distracted. This isn't the root of the issue. You have to go in to what is getting in the way of you getting what you want. You have to work on this from both aspects. And the only reason that we only focus on what we want and the cognitions is because we don't understand the emotions. Your cognitions affect your emotions, true, to some extent. But ultimately, that's not helpful. Otherwise, cognitive behavioral therapy would be more effective in the long term, and it's simply not. And there's a lot of denial about this in academia. And the only reason there's a lot of denial is because there's really no other perceived way. But I'm going to offer a different way. First, let's go through some quotations just to see what I mean, what we've been talking about. Um, and I chose these at random. And again, you'll see that they're chosen at random because some of them are actually helpful. So this one's from Epictetus. The chief task in life is simply this to identify and separate matters so that I can say clearly to myself, which are externals, not under my control, externals, automatically not under my control. Do you see that? And which have to do with the choices I actually control. Now, I agree with this. This is right to some degree. But you don't get to this realization by just identifying in your mind, by retreating to your stoic lair and identifying in your mind, oh, that's my roommate and his dirty dishes. I don't have any control over that. Well, you don't really know what you have control over until you start communicating, until you start developing a boundary. And you do this by interacting in the world, not by retreating and intellectualizing. And again, in the end of the quotation, not to uncontrollable externals. Again, anything outside of you is ultimately outside of your control. This is what he's saying. Epictetus was a slave. He developed this to be a good slave, inadvertently. I mean, that's obviously not the point. Very similar to, to Victor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning. This is the, these are his thoughts in a concentration camp. Yes. That's a great way to think if you're in a concentration camp and there's nothing else you can do. 
So what are you implicitly teaching yourself about the world when you're learning Stoicism? That you are a slave. That you may as well be in a concentration camp. And this quotation, Marcus Aurelius, run down the list of those who felt intense anger at something, the most famous, the most unfortunate, the most hated, most whatever. Where is it all now? Smoke, dust, legend, or not even a legend. If you're upset, what is? who cares? It's just you getting upset. It's just your small little emotion. Who are you to have an emotion? Oh, you think you matter because you're so upset? Oh, your first world problems? This is stagnation. Maybe you getting angry, maybe it's irrational in that moment, but you're only going to know that. Unless you can engage with it. Unless you can ask yourself, well, where is this coming from? Of course I'm going to be dead soon. I I can use the I'm going to be dead or we're all going to be dead at some point to say the inverse. What does it matter either way? Yeah, we're all going to be dead soon. So, okay. Let's quote, waste our time talking about my anger then. if, If it doesn't matter. This is denial. This is self-denial. This is passivity. This is the bad kind of acceptance, exactly what the Stoics say. And this is unmasculine. This is decidedly non-masculine. Oh, just got to accept whatever happens. Oh, you can't convince... Okay, okay, well, why don't you just try talking to your roommate? Not even that? Why don't you try talking with the guy at the cocktail party? Why don't you get a little bit angry? See what happens. See what that reveals about you. No, because you're scared. You're scared of your emotions. You're scared of who you are. That's why you do it. This one from Seneca. How does it help, dot, 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 to make troubles heavier by bemoaning them? You see the conflation here? Talking about your problems, talking through your emotions, is inadvertently complaining. You're inadvertently going to be a drag on somebody else if you're talking about your emotions. I mean, this is true if you don't understand emotions. And you don't see them as ultimately the root of your action. And if you really want to change your action, if you really want to change how you are in this world, you got to look at the emotion. And yeah, you got to talk about it. So the solution here isn't to turn away from the emotion. It seems like a solution. It seems nice. But the real solution is to understand how emotions work. All the better if that understanding informs the proper way to talk about emotion. And that's exactly what we do here at Animus. All right. This is Marcus Aurelius. Choose not to be harmed and you won't feel harmed. Choose or don't feel harmed and you haven't been. Or maybe looking at why you were harmed. What this harm means about you will help you understand yourself better, help you ultimately uh, 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 have more control over your action and ultimately help you uh, to, to learn more about who you are and to be less harmed in the future. Not because you convince yourself to be less harmed, but because you have a stronger sense of identity now. So you're just naturally not going to feel harmed. So when somebody, you have a hater online, you just ignore your haters. What, what, what even is hater? I mean, just the, the fact that we're so sensitive to this. In uh, Yeah, an indication of the fact that we're so sensitive to this is that we have this term haters. Like you're not supposed to get criticized for something that you do. It's just insane. I view it as an extension of the Oedipal problem in society. It's just so pervasive. Nobody even questions it anymore. Everybody's supposed to love everything I do, like my mom. And if you don't, then you're a hater. No, they may actually have good points. I get criticism a lot. And sometimes they yeah, make a good point. That's fine. It can be both things. Oh, this one's great. Alexander the Great and his mule driver both died and the same thing happened to both. You're going to die anyways. Who cares? Why bother trying? This is not a philosophy for life. This is the meditations of a guy who's already an emperor. Just musings. (laughs) Like, this is a thought experiment. Maybe it doesn't matter. If anything you do uh, on this earth matters because Alexander the Great and his mule driver are both in the same spot. 
That is a thought. This is not a philosophy for living. By Epictetus, don't seek for everything to happen as you wish it would, but rather wish that everything happens. I can't even get through this. But rather wish that everything happens as it actually will. Then your life will flow well. Yeah, it's going to flow well. Is that happiness? No conflict? No rage? Is, is that what we want? Do you hear this? This is just quotations taken at random from a site, uh, from a site that promotes stoicism. Oh, this is the manly philosophy. This is ridiculous. God. The more I think about this, the more I talk about this. No wonder guys are miserable. <laughs> no wonder they're tuned out from women. No wonder there's MGTOW. No wonder there's feminism. When there's ultimately a protest of single women not having a man in their life. No wonder. This is what the best... And this is what... Yeah, if you got into socialism, you're probably smart. This is what you do. Unbelievable. All right, we're running along here. Part six, healthier way. Yeah, structure, good. We need a structure for our life. So let's get into philosophy. Let's create a structure. However, emotions are necessary. You're not just going to turn away from them. You're not just going to rationalize them away. They're going to come back and bite you. If you ignore them and you wake up the next morning to do two hours of calculus homework, you might just find yourself lost on YouTube. That's what's going to happen. It's not because you're bad or weak. It's because there's a process going on here that you don't understand. So let's create a structure for MF and emotions. A structure that, hey, maybe in, even informs a map of our unconscious bonus. If this unconscious map informs exactly how to talk about our emotions and exactly what to do to manage them. That's your anger. This is one half of your emotional life. This is your anxiety. This is one half of your emotional life. All this denial, all this turning away from, all this, oh, it's my problem that my roommate leaves. It's my problem that I get upset. It's not my roommate. It's my problem if he doesn't do his own dishes. Seneca, Epictetus, welcome to America. That was great if you're a slave. This is from Badger Clark. That I ask my God to spare is a little daily bread in store with room to fight the strong for more. This is the 19th century, the Enlightenment attitude. This is when the Enlightenment came to fruition in the 19th century. Yeah, I know Badger Clark he probably wrote this in the 20th century. That's when he died. But I mean, it was this is very much the spirit of the 19th century. I just want to fight. I want room to fight. This is your free will. This is the extent that you have free will and you get more room to fight when you look at the emotions. This is how it works. Hear me now, believe me later. This is how it works. Yeah. Stoicism might have been good for the, the, the Greeks in 200 BC as it was clear the stronger empire was taking them over. Is that what's going on now? Maybe implicitly that's what you think is going on now. And that's something to, to talk about in therapy before you start planning a philosophy for your life. And then, of course, from famous pioneers, oh, pioneers, we primeval forest felling, we the river stemming, vexing, we and piercing deep the minds within. What minds is he talking about? Obviously. Going, f yeah, expanding into the West. But what are you ultimately doing? What are you ultimately digging into as you do that, as you engage ever more with reality, as you yell at your roommate about his dishes, as you get in an argument at a dinner party? Oh, I don't want to upset anybody. Mm. You're just cutting off parts of yourself. You're not digging the minds within. We the surface broad surveying. We the virgin soil upheaving. Pioneers, oh pioneers. What's it going to be? Seneca, Epictetus, Victor Frankl, Marcus Aurelius, slaves in a sense. Are you going to reach out and you're going to engage? Well, I hate to break it to you, but in order to do this in the proper way, you got to get clear about emotions, what they are, talk through them. If somebody harms you, you don't just turn away from it. You go, well, this means something about me. If you get upset, good. You get anxious, good. Full of rage, good. We want that. Anything else is just self-denial and you are the ultimate tool by which 
you interact with this world. All right. Any questions? Animus at animusempire.com. Schedule free consultation. Animusempire.com slash schedule. And I leave it there. Thank you guys. And I wish you all the pain and all the joy that comes from being in touch with reality.